Welcome to this year-end edition of Cash Rendezvous. We're joining you from the heart of USU's campus, just outside the Taggart Student Center. And coming up. And she asked me, where are we going? And I say, I don't know where we are going, but we're just leaving. Cache Valley is home to refugees from all over the world, why their stories are important, and how people in the valley are helping to share them. That's how we express our culture through movement. You may not see this every day on campus, We'll show you why dances like these help students connect with their culture. So stick around for this edition of Cash Rendezvous. I'm Sarah Murphy. And I'm Nathaniel Gillis. USU says there are currently 30,000 students enrolled at USU. And these students represent all 29 counties across Utah, all 50 states in the United States, and 69 countries around the world, including Ukraine. And due to the recent events with the war in Ukraine, our thoughts are often turned to refugees fleeing that country. While that conflict might seem worlds away, Emma Fates joins us to bring it closer to home with stories of refugees from all over the world living in Cache Valley. That's right. When I talk to different organizations that work with refugees here, I learned that last year they served refugees and other immigrants from over 72 different countries. Now I learned more about their stories and how we can better welcome refugees into our communities. It really was like, I couldn't believe and I say, if it's a dream, I want to wake up. The room was silent. What's going on? And she told me that Taliban is hand over the cobble. As Marwa shared her story at Utah State to a crowd gathered in the Echoes Conference Center. And all my dream is destroyed and all my... And I, first of all, I lost my family and I thought that we are going to leave, but no one knows when I can, when I will be able to visit them again. Through tears, Marwa shared how she left Afghanistan in August of 2021. After the Taliban took over her hometown, Kabul, she left her family. I really wish to hug my mom at least. And not many dry eyes were left in the audience as Marwa continued, saying after finally getting to the United States, she was told she would have to start her career as an air traffic controller from scratch. But then in one, night, one minute, it just all gone. It's a story that doesn't have a happy ending yet, and while Marwa was brave enough to share her story in front of people on camera on stage, organizations in the Valley say not everyone is. It's a hard time for them, really hard. Now, let's read this. His first name is Who. The English Language Center teaches English classes and life skills to refugees and other immigrants. Do you have an M? No, I don't. Games are helping these students learn, but the center says some of their refugees don't need classes yet. They just need love. We love our students. That's our most important thing. Learning how to get a driver's license and driving a car are one of the many skills the center staff say they teach refugees. But they also learn how to find an apartment like this one and learn how to talk to their landlords with any issues they might have and pay rent online so they can actually stay in their apartment. Now center staff say no matter where these refugees are at in their journey, whether they just got here and they need a little extra help to start their new lives, or whether they've been here for a while and they're actually really a part of the community now, helping them, they say, is one of the best decisions they have ever made. I feel I've been the luckiest person on earth because our students have changed my life completely. She had short, short long, long hair. hair. Classes have been going at this center for 24 years. Your hair is uh, uh, curly, curly, curly. From bookwork to life skills, center staff say they try to give all the knowledge and resources they can. I will share because it's my duty to do so. It's, it's what I feel is required of me because of what I have. Yes, I do. Jensen says it's the students and the progress they make that keep her going. We see many of them walk in here with their heads hanging down, but they walk out with holding their heads high. 
I grew up learning English and speaking English, and I know it's, it's a big surprise, but a few years ago I lived in Japan and I started learning Japanese, and I have to say, living in a place where you don't speak the main language, I feel like a resource like the English Language Center would be really useful. Yeah, and you know, I lived in Chicago for a little bit. I volunteered at a place called Working Bikes, and I had the privilege to work with a lot of refugees and fix up their bikes so that they could travel around town. But uh, for Cache Valley and Utah State, are there any resources for refugees here? Yeah, so of course the English Language Center is a great one, but then there's also the Cache Refugee and Immigrant Connection Center. And then for people who are looking to get involved here at USU, um, there's the Their Story is Our Story Club, where they focus on just telling stories of refugees. We're here at the Taggart Student Center balcony where Jake Ellis conducted some interviews right inside. He joins us now to tell us a little more of what those interviews were about. Yeah, so are you guys on TikTok? I am. I'm definitely more of a consumer than a creator. I, I don't post, but I do watch the videos. I totally agree. I just like liking videos mm -hmm. and then re-watching those videos, but I've never posted anything. Right. Well, that's kind of what those interviews were about. I recently came across a TikTok account called The Black Menaces. It's run by BYU students, and they go around their campus and ask questions that start conversations. So I wanted to see what those answers would be to the same questions here at Utah State. My name is Rachel, and I'm a menace. My name is Nate, and I'm a menace. These Brigham Young University students are going viral for their TikToks. They go around their campus and ask people their opinions on gender, sexuality, and race. So the question is, what did you learn about black history in high school? Both BYU and USU say a large majority of their students are white. USU social media professor Deborah Monson says there is one big difference between the students at both institutions. We have the highest percentage of students who live away from home and who live on campus, right? And when you leave home, I tell my students this all the time in JCOM 1500, our job is to help you form your own opinion. Okay, so the question is, do you believe that institutionalized racism exists? We decided to copy the Black Menaces experiment to see if there's a difference in responses at USU and picked some highlights. We went around campus with two interviewers, one who was black and one who was white, to see what responses we would get and see if they would be different depending on who interviewed the person. Keep in mind, this is a small sample and may not represent USU as a whole. All right, so our first question is, what is one black historical figure that you look up to? There are many. For me, um, you know, I think, you know, the typical that a lot of white folks might say is Martin Luther King, but I think Bayard Rustin, uh, my particular favorite is um, James Baldwin, the author. And that really surprised me because I've never heard of James Baldwin before this semester, and he came out with all these different people that I've never heard of, and I don't know, I guess, yeah, he did surprise me. And what about Blue Lives Matter? Uh, not so much. <laughs> you want to expand on that? Um, I mean, uh, my, my, my whole opinion is that you can, you can choose to be a cop and like everybody deserves respect. We can't really choose your ethnicity, your sexual orientation. So there's no reason to start a movement for a group of people that has been given power by the public. That's not really something I've really thought of before. Uh, I personally don't really think I support either organization because I'm not out there doing anything for them. But I do think that uh, they kind of like swayed my opinion a little bit. I would definitely support Black Lives Matter more because of that. Do you support Black Lives Matter? No, I don't. Do you expand on that? I don't think that Black Lives Matter really represents um, what a genuine group of people who feel that there's racism that exists, I don't think that that, that community represents like that well. I think that, like, I don't know how to explain it very well. I just don't think their, their standards and their morales are very good, um, especially for a community that's supposed to be um, trying to fix a problem. I just don't think that they do a good job of that. Okay. Do you support Blue Lives Matter? Blue Lives Matter. I have no idea what that is. It was interesting to see that like he didn't know anything about it and so like 
Do we even need to talk about it? Do you support Blue Lives Matter? Do you guys know what that is? Have you heard of that? No. No. no? So um, Blue Lives Matter essentially in the same way that um, Black Lives Matter represents um, black Americans and sort of, you know, wants to state that their lives matter, right? Similarly with policemen and their blue uniforms, right? That policemen's lives matter, right? Mm -hmm. So um, would you say that you support Blue Lives Matter as well? Yes, of course. I mean, every life matters on the planet, so, I mean, on the earth, so I think, yes. After I explained it as um, objectively as I could, she was like, yeah, of course, I support Blue Lives Matter. Like, all lives are important. We want, I want everybody to be supported. And, and that was a real eye-opener, because there was some people who were really, most people, I would even say, from our interviews anyway, were relatively anti-Blue Lives Matter. I love any content that pushes people to think and challenges people to understand their world in a different way. And it seems like that's really what the Black menaces are trying to do. And Monson says part of critical thinking is getting out of your echo chamber. Well, what is an echo chamber? It's when we surround ourselves with people that look, think, and have similar experiences as ourselves. We all love our iPhones, right? Yeah. Monson says to get out of your echo chamber, you can invite new voices into your group, or you can step out of your comfort zone. This type of content can use hashtags to break into conversations that it wouldn't generally be in, invited into. It can also just through asking the simple question, those students who got asked that question are going to move on and tell their friends. I learned a lot about uh, who people are and who people perceive themselves as. And um, I was impressed that there were enough people willing to talk to us, honestly, like, hey, I got some racial issues. You want to you wanna talk? No, like, I mean, like if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, nah, dude. I actually did the other day meet one of the ladies that's in the Black Menaces. It's pretty cool what they're doing, but I don't know that it'll really have a big effect. I think it's just cool to have some entertainment and to really think about the issues. Through our 12 interviews across campus, we had a lot of the same answers, but I was curious, would you guys be willing to answer the same questions? You know, as a Native American, I think these conversations, or these questions, excuse me, spark really good conversations. I wouldn't even hesitate to say yes. You know, I feel like I have to agree. I feel like the opportunity to kind of have a conversation, see where it goes, would be pretty interesting. And coming up. Kainua Johnson will give us a look at how hot this summer will be and if we should be expecting any rain. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in, in my, my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. I. I believe. I believe that. I believe that we. I believe that we will make a difference. We will treat everyone with respect. We will stop violence of every kind on campus. We will build each other up and not tear each other down. We will know where to get help when a friend is struggling. We will value the dignity in every person. We will stand up to protect our Aggie family. If I could go back and change it all, I would. I would. I think I'm gonna miss you the most. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Or maybe it's just the little moments. I could go back and change, I could go back and change it all. I could go back. I would. But I can't. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at seizetheawkward.org.
just outside the TSC is this sculpture. Now, most students call it the hand statue, but it actually does have a name. It's called Synergy, and it's based on principles including teamwork, unity, and friendship. Kayla Peterson joins us to tell us how one group of students uses dance as a way to build their synergy. Thanks, Sarah. I talked to members of the Pacifica Student Union, and we talked about how dance is a way they become unified with their culture. We're very blessed to be able to put on uh, this luau tonight. Sione Sahaki has been dancing since he was in high school and has continued throughout college. This year, uh, we practice so much. So we had about four choreographers, and we were practicing three times a week since January. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot of dancing. <laughs> Siake is the president of the Pacifica Student Union this year. It used to be the Polynesian Student Union, but he changed it to make it more inclusive. The Polynesian islands are only a small sector of the Pacific Islands, so including Micronesian islands and Melanesian islands and their students uh, who connect that way so that we can better uh, include members of our community and have more of an inclusive space. <laughs> The vocals were part of the dances at the Pacifica Student Union Luau. And dances are a way to show how much they love their culture. I dance because of the love for my culture. I just um, I just want to keep on perpetuating it and I don't ever want it to die. And I just want to um, share it with the world and share it with as much people as I can. I think that's a big part of it is just sharing it with those around us and bringing awareness to it and letting other people see and experience it as well. This is a handmade costume they wear to dance in New Zealand. The costume symbolizes their culture and they say it's a way to express who they are. It's how we express our culture through movements. We're a very physical uh, community, a very physical culture, and so it's how we articulate um, the past and the present and the future. As the music intensifies, so does the dancing. Not only is the fire visual and entertaining to watch, the fire is a traditional Samoan weapon. Not only um, are there risk of getting burned, but there's always also risk of getting um, cut as well. So just that adrenaline and that excitement that it brings to me, it's always fun to be able to do that. Siaki says the luau is special to him and he was happy to see it return after three years. I love it. I, I love uh, being a Pacific Islander. I love being Tongan and I, it's a very important part of who I am. So Kayla, the first time I was introduced to the hula was through Lilo and Stitch. But I found out my grandma's Hawaiian and that I'm related to King Kamehameha, the last king of Hawaii. That's so cool, Nathaniel. Actually, at the luau, they taught members of the audience the hula. It's super cool to see how one dance that unifies a culture can be taught and shared with others. Thanks, Kayla. And after all of the long winter months in Logan, the weather's starting to heat up quite a bit. Let's throw it to Kainoa Johnson for our weather forecast. And with this being our last show, we aren't going to give you a seven day forecast. Instead, we're going to go ahead and look at the next three months. This graph here is a seasonal temperature prediction for May through July. Now, the entire country is expecting heat increases, of course, but here in Utah, we're right dab smack in the middle of this red spot, which means it's going to be hot. We're expecting heat increases of 60 to 70 percent and increases in temperatures, of course, can lead to environmental issues, especially when there's this little rainfall. In summertime is when we tend to see drier conditions, and so that's when the state tends to dry out normally. We're getting far below normal precipitation. This is year three for that, and temperatures season after season after season are above average. And just like Meyer said, this graph here is showing a below normal amount of rainfall for the months of May through July across most of the west side and midwest of the United States. In Utah, in the northern half, we are going to be seeing a below average amount of rain. As we move further south, we will be seeing more or less, however. Now, these are just predictions, and knowing how bipolar Utah weather can be, we really don't know what's in store. But hopefully, this does give us a better idea of what our summer's going to be like. You're all caught up in weather, and coming up. Volleyball is a traditional sport we all know. I'm JC Caldwell, and coming up, I'll tell you about an unconventional sport people are doing to get their sweat on. The little things aren't as big of worries anymore. We'll show you how one girl went from being completely dependent to self-reliant and successful. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth. 
without any bread and kiss them all soundly Lights out. Good night. and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. <laughs> If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. A sport that used to be taboo is coming out from behind the curtains and gaining traction for the public. JC Caldwell joins us to tell us more about this sport. Yeah, thanks Nate. And this sport for years has had a reputation as a dirty act done for well, immoral crowds. But now the Global Association for International Sports Federation has officially named it a sport in 2017. Jams help Jamie Dewey get in the mood to spin on her pole in the basement of her parents' house. She says learning tricks like these made her fall in love with the sensual sport the first time she tried it. I just, I want to advance as much as I can. Hopefully, I've never competed. I want to compete one day. This smile is from the empowerment and confidence she says Paul gives her. But Dewey says it takes a toll on your body. They look worse than they are. I've been sore consistently for the past month. She says she also gets friction burns that can come from too much grip aid. This is grip aid. Pole dancers will use it to help them stick to the pole. They'll also normally be wearing a little less clothing than I'm wearing now. If you have a lot of clothes on, you'll just slide right off of it. Brown says holding moves is one of the hardest parts of pole dancing for her. She got first place at a 2019 FitCon competition with this routine. This is one of my very first times pole dancing myself. And I gotta say, it is a lot of fun, but definitely harder than it looks. You gotta really like love it and be willing to put a lot of time into it because it doesn't come easy. I couldn't even get my feet off the ground. Like my first class, it was so hard. Dancing and gymnastics brought Brown to the pole. She says it felt like the two hobbies mixed together. Like I couldn't find a, you know, a gyms where I could do gymnastics anymore. And I actually injured my knee. She started pole for the acrobatic side. But she says feeling sexy was a fun addition. That's part of it is, you know, wearing little booty shorts and a sports bra. And it feels good to feel like, okay, I'm okay to show off my body. And like Brown, Dewey also doesn't mind the sexual side of it. I don't take any shame, and I don't think a lot of people who do pull take shame in knowing that, um, you know, this came from strippers. You know, and it's sensual and, you know, it can be erotic and sensual. And I just think that adds to the art. That's like an, kind of an old school mentality. And it just, I mean, I think it's a beautiful art form and sport. And, you know, if a woman, like, if that's how she chooses to, like, move her body, like, we're sexual creatures, we're humans. Like, that's a big part of our life. Okay, next question. This sexual positivity panel led to conversations about where survivors of sexual abuse can turn to heal. Because there's help out there for you. Experts With say anyone can use the sport to reclaim their sexuality. It seems to be like a really cool way to express yourself and express your sexuality and connect with your body. It's like freeing for them to be able to explore that part of them and it's like a way of taking their power back. I've allowed people to make me feel like so small and this has been like the hardest thing, but the best thing I've done for myself. Dewey says she can't wait for the next time she gets to put her pole back up and dance. I had no idea the amount of athleticism and skill it took to kind of go into pole dancing. I mean, seeing the bruises on Jamie's legs and that seems pretty intense. And it was intense. She actually let me try out my own pole dancing on her pole and it was a lot of fun, but even with that grit aid, like it's super hard. Like you use so many muscles you wouldn't even think of. Yeah, I have a couple friends who do pole dancing for exercise. I decided to give a good old go around the pole and I fell flat on my back. last brought you the story of Sarah Fry. Her parents were helping her learn life skills after a drunk driver hit her car head on. Now she's on her own and teaching us. 
Hi, welcome to Twisted Sugar. Go ahead and order whenever you're ready. When you place your order at Twisted Sugar Over the 32 hours. and go through the drive through Okay, there you go. You might see Have a good one. A familiar face. <laughs> but you won't see what's behind the wall. We'll have those right out for you. About a year and a half ago, almost two years. It's kind of crazy, like... Obviously, that's something that's on my mind as summer approaches. Mom, may I please go grab me my phone? We first met Sarah in November 2020, a few months after a drunk driver hit her car. She lost both legs. She was 17. Sarah says she relied on her parents for almost everything. One, now, at 19, she says she does it all herself. I was just relying on my parents all the time. Just with everything, they had to help me even sit up in the morning and get out of bed and brush my hair because my arms weren't strong enough. But it's good, like it, it's, it's just a reminder of how far I've come and how many things I've accomplished in two years. <laughs> One year after the crash, Sarah went to college, living in the dorms. She's wrapping up her freshman year at USU. I thought that I would you know, not go to college this soon. It's been cool it's just like seeing my progress and seeing myself get stronger and doing the things that I couldn't before. For example, like football games, if she has to, she has to find an adjusted way to do that. She can't just walk down the bleachers, but she's very mature about it, knowing who to talk to and being comfortable with her situation. She works on getting stronger every day. And while it's not always perfect, this is hard. she stays smiling. <laughs> Working out has helped me just be more confident in my own abilities. I always have a new goal for how many pull-ups I should do. I've done seven in a row, but in one day I've done like 15 or 20, taking breaks a little bit. My goal before I leave is to do 10 in a row. <laughs> how many could you do before the crash? Oh. None. With her personal Instagram, her Strong Like Sarah Instagram, and her TikTok, Sarah's progress has caught the eye of thousands. Between all three platforms, she inspires more than 170,000 social media followers. We were at the mall one time, and there were these two cheerleaders that came up to her, and they both covered their mouths, just so shocked. And they were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity. They're like, can we please get a picture? I feel like I'm meeting someone famous. Like, freaking out. And it's just so cool to see how many people she's impacted. This is my little steering knob so that I can steer with one hand. With adaptive controls, she can drive herself. It didn't take me that long to learn. But she's still driven. A couple months after the crash happened, I was asked if you could go back, would you change what's happened? Would you choose to not get in the car that day. And I was like, absolutely, I would go back. I would not want this to have happened to me. But now, just recently, someone asked me again, if you could go back and change what has happened, would you? And right now, my answer would be no, I wouldn't go back because I've been able to see the good that has come from it. I've been able to help and I've been able to have so many amazing opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I would car accident that put me in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, but I am doing all of the things that I can do and making the most of my amazing life that I have. Sarah says she's moving home for the summer, but she hopes to work in an elementary school classroom this fall semester. I think she's going to make an amazing teacher one day. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us on this year-end edition of Cash Rendezvous. Have an amazing summer, Cash Valley. First night here, but Amy seems cool. <laughs>
Leading down to the river I am blind but I need not see What do you think? I know this road is there for me If I'm really free Take me down to the river and there are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. This is a serious problem, but one we can solve. Visit feedingamerica.org to help. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're feeding America.